All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We have folks coming in. I'll be letting them in as they enter the waiting room. But I'll start with a little housekeeping. Uh, today is our webinar on the role of the hospitalist in telehealth, and we will have some fun case reviews. Uh, Dr. Carruthers joining us from Texas, and Dr. Schweitzer joining us from uh, rural Nebraska. So excited to uh, have them here today, and we will get going in just a minute or two as I let a few more folks in. All right, well, I have everybody that's in the waiting room in and join now. I think everybody, I got one still connecting to audio, but we're getting there. Uh, Dr. Schweitzer, Dr. Brothers, welcome. And uh, we're excited to hear from you today. Um, I kind of peeked at the slides, so you guys have some fun stuff coming up. Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? You guys can introduce yourselves and we'll go from there. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to take myself off video while, while I present. So um, thanks for joining everyone. Really appreciate that you took the time to uh, spend time with us today. Wanted just to review a little bit um, about the hospital's role in telehealth uh, that Dr. Crothers and I do every day, and then some case reviews uh, to chat about today. So a little bit about me. I was in board certified uh, family medicine since 2012. I've been an outpatient provider. I started off in 2012 at an outpatient, as an outpatient provider in a town of about 25,000. At that time, there was a hospital with 180 beds. I did outpatient medicine uh, in the beginning and then kind of transitioned to hospitalist and really found that I really love the hospitalist role. In 2015, I needed, uh, due to life situation, needed to make a transition and move. And so I started looking for hospitalist positions. Uh, when I was in the process of doing that, I heard about a, a situation that, you know, I never heard about before. The They tried to describe what it was going to be like. And I when I first heard it, it was very intriguing to really hold hands with technology and then push medicine forward. And I could just see the future of how that could really help. And the mission was always to serve underserved communities and to really realize how valuable that could be. I could just see the future even back in 2015. So I joined Teledyme Health in 2015, became full-time doing this. And that actually allowed me to have more time to, to work at other facilities. So I also work at a 600 bed acute care hospital and a critical access hospital. So I guess I, I feel like it's able to keep me relevant, seeing it from all sides, the acute bedside, the critical care side, and then the telehealth side, just being able to be in all, all three part of those situations. I'm gonna pass it off to my partner, Dr. Carruthers. She's from the land in the South, way nicer than where I am, so. Thank you, Asha. Um, hi, everyone, my name is Irene Carruthers. Uh, I am a board certified internal medicine physician. I was certified in uh, 2012. Um, I am uh, in Dallas, Texas, and I'm born and raised here. Um, and I uh, was a hospitalist in Dallas for um, about right around 10 years um, after finishing my internal medicine residency there. And in 2021, I just wanted more autonomy. And, you know, I, my children were a little older and they just needed more of my time. So I decided to go into the locum space and I was a locum hospitalist for uh, two years there. And during that time, I also worked with um, a company, American Well, and I did uh, in telehealth more from the urgent care space. So that opportunity allowed me to um, acquire several licenses. I'm licensed in 12 states currently. And um, and while doing that, I just kind of fell in love with the telemedicine space and just one, the autonomy that I had, the uh, ability to just kind of see patients remotely and just see that the technology was there and there was really not 
uh, a drop off in the care for the patients when I used that 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 platform, and I just was really intrigued by it. And so I just was as a hospitalist, I was like, wow, I love inpatient medicine. That is my bread and butter. That's where I was trained. And I was like, why wouldn't it be great if there was an opportunity to be a hospitalist um, through the telemedicine space? So I joined a group on Facebook for um, individuals or physicians interested in telemedicine. And I just kind of put it out there. And a lovely lady by the name of Dr. Naz let me know that there was an opportunity um, with a company called Teledyne Health, which she was associated with. And she told me about it and put me in contact with the right individual. And as of 2023, I've been a hospitalist with Teledyne Health and I have loved that opportunity to work with my colleagues and also just provide care for patients in rural areas and to see how we're able to impact those communities has been really, um, just really rewarding. Thank you. So kind of just wanted to chat a little bit about telehealth and then what we see as a hospitalist role and really just to answer these three main questions. So this is a pretty basic uh, topic, why, who, and how? So the why, as you can see, this is from the American colleges. They're projecting a national physician shortfall in every specialty. So looking at where it starts, this graph on at 2018, by 2032, just the mid-range estimation is 96,000 physician shortfall in every specialty. And so if you can imagine every specialty uh, with this much shortage in trying to recruit and find physicians to go to underserved and rural populations, it's even more of a shortfall area. So the other scenario is, or the other why is just different scenarios. And if you kind of think about it, you can kind of think of multiple situations that arise in facilities that can cause, or, or there's a gap so telehospitalists don't usually go into a situation where there's lots of uh, volume. They don't usually go when there's where there's a place where there's lots of resources and, and people who apply for jobs. It's usually in a place where there is a gap, where there's a shortage, where there's a need. So thinking about different scenarios, uh, the first one I have listed is kind of avoidable inter-facility transfers. So you have a patient who presents to an emergency department in a small hospital. He needs to be seen by a specialist, but no one is available. If they, they end up getting transferred out of that ED to a different hospital a few miles away from his hometown, at that ED, he is evaluated by the specialist that was needed, but ends up having repeat testing done. Some of those tests, they were already completed at the first hospital, but they didn't get transferred over. Then when the specialist, after he evaluates him, he, he realizes, hey, this guy doesn't need to be admitted. He can be discharged and he safely followed as an outpatient. So you can see they, the multiple resources going into seeing that patient then transferring to another facility when he really could have just went home and followed as an outpatient. So it'd be a great, great situation for telehealth that could have at that first facility that could have helped with that. Second scenario, talking about locations with low volume and low resources. Low resource uh, locations because of the call schedule and lack of specialty support. If you kind of think about, you have a hospitalist who's been working in the, a rural facility for seven days on, seven days off, they're working 24 hours. A lot of these are staffed 24 hours a day. If they aren't, if they get a patient at 1 a.m. and that patient's gonna need critical care monitoring, multiple labs drawn, uh, be, the nurses are gonna be calling frequently and the doc's already been on for five days and this is the fifth night. And so it's so much easier at that point to say, hey, just transfer this person. It's kind of, I, I can't deal with this tonight. I need sleep because I have another two days to do. So in that scenario, at some times the, the provider would choose to transfer when they could keep them in the facility. 
The third scenario just wanted to chat about is pa patient satisfaction. So in the rural EDs that we serve and the rural hospitals that we serve, the patients come in and they expect to go home. And if they don't get to go home, the last thing they wanna do is transfer. They, they almost always choose to want to stay in their facility. They know the nurses, the house supervisor is their neighbor. Like they like the facility, they know the people and they wanna stay there. And just looking at different pain points of hospitals, when you have physician turnover, how can you recruit a physician, maintain their wellness in rural areas where it's very difficult, as we saw the shortage map, it's very difficult to even recruit. So how can you retain them? How can you keep them to, to happy and well enough to stay for a long amount of time so you're not constantly having turnover? We talked a little bit about the cost. When you're transferring patients, there's always a cost associated with the transfer of the actual patient, then you have the cost of um, medical tests being done, sometimes being repeated. You have the cost to the family of having to travel back and forth, and then also the patient satisfaction. And that's where really the role of a telehospitalist can come into play and can really be actually a source of great benefit for these hospitals. So talking about who could do this, we have board certified family medicine providers, internal medicine providers, and pediatricians that can help cover these hospitals in these areas of need. Each one, um, if they're in different states, all the states have different criteria and credentials that need to, to be had in order to practice there. So really staying on top of um, different state licenses and then multiple providers at different locations. And then the how, really these three things are each vitally important by themselves. So having a secure HIPAA compliant platform, we had at Teledyne from the beginning, um, there was that long period of where COVID allowed for some different platforms to be used, but I think in the end it will end up being, everything will need to be HIPAA compliant. So starting from there in the beginning, uh, really just made a solid foundation really determining your part in the EMR. So being able to access different tests, imaging studies, being able to do chart reviews from two years ago, uh, that is all very beneficial and the ability to carry out healthcare, uh, doing it via telehealth, and then provider communication. So really realizing your role in the team that in order for telehealth to work, you have to communicate to the providers who are there. You have to communicate to the nurses who are there. And then in, in that, is it with documentation and or communication outside of the EMR? So that's just a little bit about telehealth, about what we do, why we do it, why Dr. Carruthers and I find it, uh, really is our, we found it to be a passion of ours. So right now we're gonna transition a little bit to uh, case reviews and Dr. Carruthers, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Asha. So our first case is a 41-year-old female who presented to the emergency room uh, with a two-day history of right lower extremity pain. Um, at the time, uh, she presented, she had denied having any fevers or chills. She did state that she had um, a similar episode to this presentation uh, that was diagnosed by her PCP as an outpatient um, as cellulitis and was treated with antibiotics at the time. So she came in with a concern of having cellulitis. Uh, while in the ED, she had her vitals checked and as you can see, she had a temperature of 103.1, uh, tachycardic with a heart rate of 121. She was tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 36 and also hypotensive with her blood pressures in the 90s over 40s. Uh, pertinent labs at the time showed uh, a white blood cell count of 28.2, 
Um, she had a left shift with a neutral count of 93.3, and her creatinine was 1.26. Uh, so this was up from her baseline uh, of 0 0.69, and she does not have a history of CKD. Her lactate was also elevated to 2.4. Uh, pertinent examination findings uh, were uh, erythema to her right lower extremity. She had warmth and tenderness of palpation of that extremity up to her mid thigh region. So this young lady was diagnosed with cellulitis and um, the treatment was um, started in the emergency room with a dose of vancomycin and zosin. She was treated with a sepsis, NS, uh, normal saline sepsis bolus that was adjusted to her ideal body weight. Um, now, we reassessed her at around the three hour mark and her repeat lactate was better at 1.8. However, she remained um, hypotensive and her systolic blood pressures were in the 80s and her MAP was 57. At that point, she was persistently hypotensive. And um, at that point now met criteria for septic shock and she was started on LevoFed. Okay, so our next case is a 75 year old male who was brought to the emergency room by his family with reports of altered mental status, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So uh, per the family, on the day of presentation to the emergency room, he was becoming more lethargic and that was the concern that brought the patient to the emergency room. Uh, while in the ER, the patient was found to have a temperature of 102.4, 103.4, I'm sorry. The patient was tachycardic to 110 and respiratory rate elevated to 22. And he was also uh, hypotensive with uh, systolic blood pressure in the 90s. Uh, pertinent labs on this patient, he had a white blood cell count of 29.3. This patient had bandemia. Uh, of 13. He had a creatinine uh, of 4.01, so um, acute kidney injury. As you can see there, his baseline is 1.2, and lactate was elevated to 3.3. Uh, other labs drawn here, as you see, he had a urinalysis that showed cloudy urine, two plus um, leukocyte esterase, uh, 100 WBC than three plus bacteria. Uh, this gentleman was diagnosed with a urinary tract infection. Um, we He was treated with 30 mg per kg of um, uh, normal saline bolus in the emergency room and he received IV zosin. Um, he had uh, urine and blood cultures um, sent from the emergency room. He was also reassessed uh, and found to have a, uh, that his lactate was better, went from 3.3 to 1.7. However, he was also persistently hypotensive with his um, systolic blood pressures in the 80s to 90s um, post his sepsis fluid bolus. Um, so he also met criteria for septic shock and was started on levofen. Our third case is a 70-year-old female. Um, she had a history of dyslipidemia, hypertension, known history of cirrhosis of the liver, and she presented to the emergency room with shortness of breath and a cough. Um, she stated that this had been going on for approximately four days and her symptoms were pro progressively worsening. Um, she also denied fevers or chills, and she stated she had no known sick contacts at the time of presentation. Um, vital signs show that she had a fever with a temperature of 101.2. She was hypoxic with oxygen saturation of 84% on room air, slightly tachypneic with a respiratory rate of 21, 
heart rate was 92 and the patient was normal tensive, blood pressure of 122 over 69. Um, labs showed a white blood cell count of 5.6 was normal. Um, she did have an elevated lactate at 5.1. She had a blood glucose of 248 and she did not have a known history of diabetes. Uh, pertinent findings on her physical examination, um, she had bibasal crackles uh, on exam and a CT chest was done which showed by basilar vascular prominence with interstitial prominence um, on both sides, but particularly on the left side. She was diagnosed with pneumonia and she had uh, in the emergency room 500 uh, cc's of normal saline. Uh, sepsis bolus was held in this patient because she had visible evidence of volume overload. Where I think she had about a two plus pit in edema up to her thigh area, and she had ascites. Um, blood cultures were sent from the emergency room. She was treated with uh, IV rocepin and azithromycin. Her repeat lactate was improved to 2.3, and uh, her blood pressure on the reassessment was still normal tensive at 121 over 71. So she met criteria for sepsis. Okay, so our last case is a 69-year-old male with a known history of um, type 2 diabetes, GERD, alcoholic cirrhosis, and um, hypertension. He presented to the emergency room with a cough and dysphagia uh, for three days. This gentleman was residing in a nursing home following a recent admission for pneumonia and cultures positive for Klebsiella pneumonia. So he had just finished antibiotic therapy and he was probably two weeks um, post hospitalization at this point. So he said he suddenly developed dysphagia. Um, it was a sudden development with intolerance to both solids and liquids. So this is important as there was not a gradual you know, difficulty with swallowing solids and then, and then liquids. It was suddenly and to both um, intolerance to both liquids and solids. So on the day of admission, his daughter went to visit him at the nursing home and he was visibly uh, labored with, uh, with his breathing. So that prompted the patient being transferred to the emergency room for an evaluation. While in the ED, his vitals showed his temperature to be 97.5. He was um, tachycardic to 124. Blood pressure was um, normal tensive, 133 over 69. He did, he was tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 33, and he was hypoxic with an SpO2 of 88% on room air, and he was labeled, uh, labored in his breathing. So his labs, pertinent labs, showed a white blood cell count of 22.3, and he had a lactate of a 5.1. So in examination, he had diminished breath sounds throughout with bibasilar um, crackles. And we got a CTA of his chest, which showed bibasilar cons uh, consolidation concerning for uh, uh, aspiration pneumonia. And there was an uh, incidental finding of an uh, interval development of large soft tissue mass in the hypopharynx. And it stated that his airway was narrowed, but patent. So at that point, um, the initial thought was, okay, maybe he has some type of malignancy. Um, and we were thinking, oh, we'll bring him in for pneumonia, but, you know, have um, ENT see the patient, you know, tomorrow for further evaluation. Well, you know, as they say, your gut is like one of the most important diagnostic tools that you have. So my first thought was, well, if he has cancer, it, his, it, it, that's what's causing his um, dysphagia. It would have been gradual and not a sudden onset three days ago. So I decided to get a CTE soft tissue of the neck. In doing so, we found that he had thickening of his epiglottis that was indicative of acute epiglottitis. 
So this gentleman was diagnosed with acute epiglottitis, um, aspiration pneumonia. Um, at that point, he got NS um, sepsis bolus, 30 mg per kg in the emergency room. We got blood cultures and we had an ENT consult and the patient was seen in the emergency room and had a, uh, a scope that then led to the patient being intubated. Um, prior to that, he also received um, IV dexamethasone and racemic epinephrine in addition to the IV vancomycin and cefepine. So prior to his intubation and the ENT actually seeing the patient, we had put him on BiPAP, um, but he was not responding appropriately. So after intubation, um, the patient was monitored. Um, what we did notice is that he was persistently hypotensive. As I stated earlier, his initial lactate was, I think, 5.1. Right. But when we did his reassessment, it was, it was worsening and to 11.3. So at that point, he was given additional fluids and was started on levofed. So our patient was diagnosed with um, septic shock. And that's what Dr. Crothers and I wanted to chat about today, just reviewing sepsis, uh, sepsis guidelines, and kind of what is coming down the pipe or what's already actually in development that we need to be aware of um, doing hospital medicine. So a new definition of sepsis came out in 2016, which really changed the definition from prior in sepsis two. It was really based on SERS criteria. In 2016, the guidelines came out to define sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction due to dysregulation of host immune response to infection. And really this definition is what makes sepsis different from the actual word of just infection. Risk factors, obviously we know the very young, the very old, more susceptible, any kind of immunosuppression that's going on with a patient definitely can cause worsening organ dysfunction, increased risk of sepsis, any comorbidities, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, uh, any other comorbidities can, can worsen and increase the risk of sepsis. And it's all based on clinical criteria. So we've all heard all of these names, sepsis, sepsis syndrome, severe sepsis, uh, septic shock. I crossed out those first or those middle two. Sepsis syndrome and severe sepsis are no longer used. So we are really now just focusing on the words sepsis and septic shock. Sepsis is based on sepsis three, which I'll further define. Uh, like I said before, Surge criteria is no longer sufficient. Septic shock key features. So you have persistent hypotension despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So after the IV fluids are given, hypotension continues, thus requiring vasopressors to maintain that MAP blood pressure of greater than 65 millimeters of mercury. The second feature of septic shock is requiring serum lactate levels to be greater than two despite adequate fluid resuscitation. So in the past, it had always been uh, regarding the blood pressure, but now it was a circulatory and metabolic abnormalities are considered. So sepsis three criteria updated in 2016. You have to have an infection that's either suspected or confirmed. And then using two different scoring systems, you're able to confirm sepsis. So there's a sequential organ failure assessment, SOFA, I'll say from the rest of the slides, and then the quick sequential organ system. Both of these, it's easy to remember. You just need a score equal to or greater than two, indicating organ dysfunction. and I'll show on the next slide how these are relevant in indicating mortality and with increased numbers, you have increased risk of mortality. So the sequential organ failure assessment SOFA score, uh, you can see here, 
There's divided up into six body systems with the CNS, cardiovascular, respiratory, coagulation, liver, and renal function. Renal function looks at creatinine and or urine output. So it's something to be aware of. It gives uh, points based on those. So depending on what that patient is presenting, uh, you they will get points and it, it's just over two points. So it's, it's not too hard to get uh, plus two and that designates sepsis. If you look to that hot pink, slot, hot pink chart, you can see that the mortality rate, how it increases as, as you increase in numbers. So zero to six has less than 10, but when you get to seven to nine, you get 15 to 20% of the total score correlation to hospital mortality. The next part of sepsis three, talking about just the Q-SOFA. The Q-SOFA, way easier than that really long chart having to score everything. It is really based on three criteria. Altered mental status with a GCS of equal to or less than 14, you get a one point right there. Respiratory rate greater than or equal to 22 breaths per minute, that's also another point. And the third one is systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100. So two out of three of those, the, the quick SOFA, uh, you you're positive for a higher likelihood of poor outcomes. In 2018, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, as well as the European Critical Care Medicine, came up, came out with a management for sepsis, includes this hour one bundle for septic shock. The real reason to make this an hour one is they wanted to recognize septic shock immediately and then to initiate the management immediately and not continue to wait. So the goal is to have antibiotics given within one hour of recognition. So we all know that sepsis core measure sheet, we see it in our nightmares sometimes, um, but it, they use that to designate sepsis and then make sure that we get all of the orders that are needed for the septic shock guidelines. So measuring the lactic level uh, with other labs, CBC, CMP, other labs, Obtaining the blood cultures, the key word there is before giving the antibiotics, then giving the broad spectrum antibiotics, a rapid administration of IV fluids if hypotension is noted or if there's a lactate level greater than or equal to four. And then if the MAP is less than uh, 65 after IV fluids have been given or during IV fluid res resuscitation, starting the vasopressors. So having that uh, in our site and not, not forgetting to start the vasopressors sooner than later. And also want to re-note if, if the lactate was elevated initially greater than two, we always want to re-measure that. And I'm going to go over in the next slide, you'll see some time definitions. So guidelines-based approach uh, from this article came out and which showed the three hour and six hour septic shock bundle guidelines. So just like we talked about within three hours. If it's just sepsis, they wanna have the lactate level done, the blood cultures drawn. Again, a big hitter before the antibiotics given. Starting the broad spectrum antibiotics and then giving the IV fluid resuscitation if needed. Sepsis or septic shock, the things that you need to make sure is you're redrawing that lactate if it's greater than two. If the patient does end up Main or continuing hypotension despite the IV fluids, starting vasopressors and then maintaining the map of 65. The thing that I, I uh, honestly wasn't always doing and um, other people around me are not always doing is doing this reassessment. And we're gonna see uh, why this is gonna become very critical in the future and currently. So doing the volume reassessment, which actually needs to be documented um, by, an, by a practitioner. So the two options in doing uh, an assessment is focusing on an exam with five components of having written vital signs on the exam, doing a cardiopulmonary exam, cap refill, 
checking and documenting peripheral pulses, and then doing a skin exam. And this is always this is all after your reassessment of the initial. So you do your HMP, and then a reassessment has to be done. Um, if it if the initial sh sepsis shock diagnosed in the ER, then this the next person who sees them within six hours, this has to be documented. There are other options to doing it, um, and that would be looking at the central venous pressure or the central venous oxygen sats, bedside ultrasound, or passive fluid challenge. Uh, a lot of times these aren't available in the facilities where we work, so the focus exam is really the assessment that we have to document. So why is this important? <clears throat> SEP1 is a sepsis and septic shock management bundle. Any hospital, it's going to become, it's mandatory that any hospital receiving reimbursement from Medicare or Medicaid will have to report compliance. And the whole reason there's explicit in, intention to start sepsis management immediately. So not to wait, they want things done in order and there's time specific actions and documentation is key. Step one, the Senecare for Medicaid and uh, Medicare, they're adopting that severe sepsis and septic shock bundle as a core quality measure. The pay for performance period began in January, 2024, <coughs> excuse me. And there's a penalty or reward based on hospital performance based on the comparison of hospitals nationwide. So they will be looking at every hospital on a bell curve chart and deciding where you fall. And if you're on the right side, the hospitals will be rewarded. Uh, if you're on the left side, there will be compensation loss or penalties that will need to be paid. So this is why it will be a, you will be hearing more and more about this uh, as we go along. And like I said, this started in January, 2024. Other considerations in sepsis, uh, we all know and love procalcitonin. It's not always available at every facility, but if it is available, it can be a great uh, marker that can help you with management of care. It rises within four hours after onset and then peaks 12 to 48. It's statistically significant to have, uh, depending on the severity of the sepsis, and uh, septic shock in a patient. And because it's short half-life, procalcitonin is used to monitor response to therapy and provide guidance if medication or antibiotics need to be adjusted, changed, or if it can be de-escalated. So we use pro procalcitonin uh, quite, or almost every sepsis case. So you know you're either in, going in the right direction or you need to change. And other therapies that are still in larger, that need larger clinical trials, vitamin C, thiamine, hydrocortisone. So just a quick review of kind of the things that we chatted about today, that sepsis is an increase with the new definition of SOFA or QSOFA greater than two, always associated with infection. Sepsis management includes timing and documentation. It's very, very important. Blood cultures have to be done prior to antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics need to be ordered. And then IV fluid resuscitation needs to be within that first three hours. Lactate needs to be repeated. If septic shock is noted within six hours, vasopressors have to be given. That reassessment documentation needs to be done. And if it's not done, as long as you are documenting, the patient has CHF, the patient has ascites, IV fluid resuscitation would be contraindicated. That is fine. It just has to be docu documented. And really the whole goal is for improved patient out outcome. And then with this core measure with CMS, consequences will follow either kind of good or, or bad. So that's just a little bit of what we kind of wanted to share today. Um, just wanted to see if anybody has any questions. You can uh, either th throw them in the chat. Andy, I'll throw it back yep. to you. I have one in the chat already. So really appreciate you guys presenting today. Um, really great information. Just nice job showing, you know, you guys can take care of some pretty sick patients, uh, you know, through telemedicine. And I think this is a, a great um, example of, you know, 
cases where you know you guys have really made a difference. So one of the questions that we have is, um, <clears throat> you know, in cases like this, how how soon or what are your thoughts about getting infectious disease consult uh, for some of these folks? When would you think about doing that? How soon? Those kinds of things. So I would think about infectious disease if it's available. Um, if it's available at the facility, I would definitely, if it was a patient who had recurrent uh, either infection, that'd mm -hmm. be a number one, if you, they had recurrent or if they had a history of resistance to drugs, um, I would start that there. Or else if we start the broad spectrum antibiotics and trying to determine, what, depending on the type of infection, how long do we want to keep this running? Or, you know, do we want to start with this IV med and what if they have lots of allergies? What what do we want to transition to orally or how long orally? That if I had the question, that's when I would get infectious disease involved. Okay. And if we oh, if we ever have infectious disease available at a critical access hospital, life is so much better. So. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I think that it, it when it comes down to the patient um and the clinical situation, um, if if the patient has known history of recurrent um, infections or specifically if the patient has had previous cultures that showed um, drug resistant uh, bacteria. I think those are times where you definitely want to get the, the ID involved if they are available. Obviously, um, as Dr. Schweitzer said, in determining when to transition, how to transition off IV antibiotics and length of you know, treatment those are the times when we would definitely get them involved. But I think obviously any facility or anytime any physician has access to an infectious diseases doctor, um, it makes our lives so much easier. Yeah. No, we appreciate our ID docs. Uh, another question about order sets for sepsis. Um, and forgive me if I butcher the name of the medication you mentioned. I know I heard you say it, but I'll try to say it again. Uh, is it helpful in order sets to have the procalcitonin as part of that order set? If it's available at that facility, it's very important. And to get that baseline procal, and when you see it rising, um, you want to watch it fall. And if you can, it's so helpful when you know that you're kind of on the right track. It's kind of that secondary uh, lab that you can see it usually at baseline when they come into the ED, it's on the lower side and that 24 hour mark, it really increases. So when you see it increase at that 24 hour amount mark, you expect that. Mm -hmm. But when you can see it decrease and, and know that you're on the right track with antibiotics, whereas if it increases, it leads you to consider, oh, might need to switch antibiotics or might be resistance here even before the cultures come back. So it's, it's a great value if it's available. Thank you. Well, I don't have any other questions in the chat. Just um, from your perspective as telehospitalists, you know, how how are patients responding uh, when, you know, they roll you in on the cart and they see you on the screen? What's what's kind of their reaction to being seen and treated in that way? I would say that. Um... Initially, in some cases, sometimes it's kind of like, huh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the look on their faces. And and I see this in in inpatient brick and mortar care, I think it, but you know, one thing about being a provider or a physician is that regardless of what the patient face looks like, when you start asking questions and you start explaining things, I think every physician knows when you can just see the face change and they know that they're they're okay and that they know that they're getting the care that they that they need and they feel safe. You can see the you can see the, the the change in their face. So that's what's really special about this 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 tool is that there's not that there's there's no difference, right? At the end of the day, the fact that you can communicate with the patient, answer their questions, really explain to them what's going on, explain the diagnostic tools, what they mean, what that means for the patient, what the next steps are, answer their questions, answer the questions of their their family members. You see their face change. The same way I see their face change in person when when I walk in and they don't know me and they're want and they're they are they are not well and they feel you know, you know, you know vulnerable. So I think that 
there isn't a difference. And I think that once they see that there is no difference, you can almost see how they're like tickled by the fact that this is available. They always say, yeah, this is so neat. Yeah. Like, how yeah. can you do this? You're, you know, 600 miles away. That's, they're always, as soon as they understand, and I always try to explain, I'm here, you're there, just so they kind of know where I'm coming from. I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, across the ocean. I'm, I'm here. So <laughs> it's, once they see that, um, yeah, they're, they're actually fascinated by technology. And then the second thing I would say is I, deliver telehealth like this. And then when I'm in that critical access hospital working, I get to see pulmonology come on and they get to be in, in, I get to see it from that view, from the patient view. And wow, that is to have the specialists or, you know, when you don't feel comfortable to have a specialist be able to keep that patient there and to make the nurses comfortable, the docs who are covering comfortable and that the patient can stay in that local facility with the family being right there. I mean, that's a win in every situation. So yeah, and I, that's special. I think especially if you look at some of the cases that you reviewed today, you know, that immediate availability and nurses being able to check back in with you if anything changes, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not having to wake you up. Like if you were, uh, you know, trying to run clinic the next day or something like that, that you're there, you're available easy to connect to. I think it's just, it's such a win for these rural communities. So, all right. Well, I appreciate you guys presenting today. This has been really great. Uh, we will uh, bundle this up and post it on the website later uh, for those that might've missed it uh, or want to review it again. So appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Schweitzer, Dr. Crothers. And we will- Yep, we will have another uh, education module uh, back in June, uh, date TBD. Uh, I think we're looking at outpatient neurology and some cases there. So we will see you then. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks.